Ja, guten Abend, Seabase. Und hallo Leute im Stream, würde ich gerne sagen, aber ich glaube, das ist gerade noch nicht der Fall. Ähm, herzlich willkommen zum 51. Netpolitischen Abend. Schön, dass ihr da seid, ähm, dass ihr zur Sommerausgabe quasi da seid. Es ist heute Abend technisch so ein bisschen der Wurm drin, offenbar Kabel kaputt, Stream funktioniert noch nicht und so weiter. Aber das soll uns jetzt erstmal nicht hindern. Ja, schön, dass ihr euch auf den Weg gemacht habt zum 51. Netzpolitischen Abend, dass ihr euch vom Pokémon Go Spiel losgerissen habt vielleicht, dass ihr euch aus dem Darknet rausbewegt habt, das ist ja gerade so ein Thema, dass ihr auch vor lauter Terrorangst noch vor die Tür gegangen seid. Genau kommt ruhig noch rein, da standen eben auch noch so ein paar Stühle rum, macht es euch bequem, wenn ihr wollt. Und wenn ihr twittern wollt zum Abend, dann ist das der Hashtag für heute. NPA 051. Wir haben hier immer ein wunderbares Programm vorbereitet, heute mit zwei aktuellen politischen Themen. Ein, zum einen das, die Reform des BND-Gesetzes ähm, und zum anderen das Thema Videoüberwachung, Berlin CCTV hier in Berlin. Und wir haben zwei ja, eher künstlerisch veranlagte Themen, das Thema Machine Learning und das Thema also Machine Learning for Activists. Und ähm, Theresia ist hier, um uns ein neues Filmprojekt zum Thema Überwachung zu Digitalisierung und so weiter vorzustellen. Ähm, wir fangen jetzt gleich mal mit dem ersten Talk an. Auch wenn der Stream noch nicht an ist, die Veranstaltung wird per Video aufgezeichnet. Wenn ihr in den Frage-Diskussionsrunden danach nicht gefilmt werden wollt, dann stellt euch am besten in den Bogen da hinten, dann seid ihr frei von der Kamera. Und ansonsten würde ich jetzt sagen, äh, let's start with Jean. Um, we're switching to English. Oh, I'll switch to English now. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Jean. Who's a... Jean Coleman from the US, who is a, who's an artist and programmer who writes code for live music, for performances and for visual arts, and who just published a book on machine learning for artists, if that's right, no? Quite? Okay, okay, he's drafting it, he's, he's close to publishing it, but tonight he'll speak on machine learning for activists, not, not artists, but activists, and uh, well, we're very happy that you're here. Um, well, and maybe you do another short introduction of yourself and your work. And, uh, welcome. Okay, thanks. Thank you for having me here. I'm sorry I cannot say any of this in German, which is quite the English made, but... I hope you'll forgive me, I've been here for about a month, so maybe next time it'll be a little bit more. Um, so my name is Jean. Um, you can find most of what I'll be talking about here. Um, this is called Machine Learning for Activists, which is a bit of a departure for me. Uh, I've been mostly in the last few months, um, as was stated, talking uh, a little bit more about machine learning for artists. I've been, I um, actually um, just finished a workshop that I ran at School of Ma, um, on this topic. Uh, we had a big exhibition at Akud on Friday, maybe some of you are there. And, um, but we, and so you might be thinking, like, what does activism have anything to do with any of this? And actually, I hope to make the um, suggestion that actually they have a lot more in common than they, that may seem. Um, in the context of machine learning, and kind of more broadly, um, data science and um, artificial intelligence, things like this, um, a lot of a lot of what we really focus on is kind of this part. So you have a large corpus of data, could be any sort of media, audio, visual, um, textual. And in machine learning, we're concerned uh, with creating algorithms that are able to um, make sense of out of this data, try to, uh, try to give us um, some inferences about them, try to organize them so that we can make a bunch of applications from them. And I kind of... Um, mark this up today, so uh, a lot of the, what we might think of as applications for activism are kind of this branch here where we're interested in organizing data, so retrieving data, organizing it, visualizing it, uh, making inferences from it, and then a lot of the art stuff that we've been focusing on in this class was um, generating data, so you have this sort of model of a particular type of data, and we, we like to be able to maybe um, make machines that create interesting images or interesting sounds, and you'll see some of that. Uh, but they really actually have a lot in common. They kind of start with this as a common baseline. And I'll show you some, some work. Um, so none of this can be, uh, almost everything that I'll be talking about today are applications of neural networks. 
Um, so a lot of you are probably already at least casually familiar with these. They've been in the news a lot lately, um, certainly more than I've ever remembered them being. And they're kind of these data structures which project information from one layer to another, um, making multiplications on numbers, and then giving us a behavior that we desire by uh, training them on some particular task that we're interested in. So for example, like if we're interested in classifying uh, images of handwritten digits, we might uh, create a neural network which will project these uh, images and it will take as inputs the pixels of the image and run them through a neural network and give us 10 outputs that indicate an affinity towards a particular class. So in this case, you know, like how, how much of a 9 is this or how much of an 8 is this. And we hope it has this kind of behavior and we achieve it through um, the process of training. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to say much more about how these work. Um, I have some materials online which will, if you're interested in um, pursuing it in more depth, I'll, I'll kind of show you this a little bit later. Um, so, one of the really interesting things about neural networks and machine learning algorithms is that they're able to uh, form these sort of compositional models of things. So, for example, if we train it to recognize handwritten digits, and then we visualize the weights, and the weights are really what ca uh, characterize um, neural networks and really most machine learning supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms in general. If you visualize them, they, they look to be forming what appear to be like these sort of templates of the classes themselves. So you see the digits coming out in, the, in this. And I wish I could say more, but, but this is sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, I want to move straight into convolutional neural networks, um, which are, have been really, really at the forefront of a lot of the recent progress we've seen in this field. And um, with convolutional neural networks, we start to create deeper and deeper uh, neural networks, which have many, many layers. And in each layer, they form a sort of um, like a, a feature extraction on, on, from the previous layer, forming a detailed sort of hierarchical um, feature-based model of a particular data set like numbers. And I'm going to take you through a demo, which might um, show you this a little bit more clearly. So this is running a convolutional neural network live in, the, in this demo. And we have all of these filters. And they're really kind of like, I'm sure you know, you've seen a lot of these from computer vision. These are um, like edge detectors and filters and, and, and gradient, uh, gradient detectors, things like that. And they're extracting a particular type of pattern in any in input pixels. And what we do in the convolutional neural network is we'll take all of these and we'll kind of stack them together. And we'll, and we'll create this new volume of data which has in it all of these feature activations. And we'll move it through repeated convolutions. So at each layer, there's a new convolution that happens on that input volume. So now we're doing feature extraction upon the previous layer's features, in which case they're going to be ever more sort of abstract. So if you do this repeatedly, through convolution after convolution, you'll see that at the last layer, some of these are responding to kind of abstract concepts. And I like to try to find one of these that I think is likes to respond to faces. I can't remember which one it is, but one of these is kind of like lights up for faces. I, I've already forgotten which one it is. But all of these, they, they're kind of looking for different kinds of features that you might expect to see in images. So maybe they're looking for faces or, or shoes or blackboards or um, telephones or you know, things that are useful for the task of image classification. And then at the last layer, we can do a classification finally. So if I put this, let's put the mic up to it. Okay. Let's see. Drumstick. Yeah. And door. Microphone. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, if I put my phone to it. This one I'm cherry picking because it always likes phones. Oh, that's very good. Window shade, iPod. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's a really accurate image classifier. And um, that's interesting in itself. But what's really interesting is this right here, at, and you can't actually see my mouse here, um, this, uh, at the top, this rectangle of feature activations, they're, they're kind of like, it's kind of, you can think of it as this sort of signature which tells us um, about the image, you know, high layer, high level um, abstract features that is detected, like the, some of the things that I mentioned. Um, and it turns out that this is very valuable, and I can show you in, um, in the context of something like this, like a reverse image search. So now we're getting into things that might be interesting to you if you're working with really large volumes of data and you're interested in extracting information from it. So for example, here I have a query image and every time I hit the spacebar, it'll give us a new one and it's pulling out of a data set of 
Um, I think several uh, thousand, I think 2,000 two images in this particular demo, uh, and they're all pictures of animals. It's giving me the most similar looking images. So you see that if I, you know, if I hit this, we get all of these frogs. So here's the query image, and we get these frogs. Different frogs, hummingbirds, alligators. And you see it makes a lot of mistakes, but what's really interesting about it is that, and this one is a good indicator, you see this is, I guess this is a bat. And it's finding us other bats, and apparently some unicorns also have slipped into the image through the search results. Um, but it's interesting that it's able to find at least another bat, because these two images have superficially different colors, they have different um, lighting conditions, the bats are in different sort of orientations. So that's what's really powerful about these things. They're able to learn in an unsupervised way um, what are useful features for um, kind of clustering images together. And we can look at a few more of these. Uh, these are all randomly done. I haven't pre-sorted them or anything. And, um, and I don't have a demo for this just yet, but you can do this with really other kinds of, uh, other kinds of data as well. So anything that you can pull a feature vector from, you know, audio or text, um, you can do this kind of process on. So um, let me continue with these. So um, another thing you might be interested in doing is visualizing this data. So what we can do is, well, we were just doing like a reverse image search. Um, but it would be interesting to take all of these images and organize them in a 2D layout so that where similar images are grouped together. And we can do that using a dimensionality reduction technique called TSNI, um, which stands for T Stochastic Neighboring Embeddings, something, something like that. Um, and it's a recent technique that was developed that was dimensionality reduction in such a way that it's particularly well suited for um, visualization. So this is the same images that you saw from that demo, and they've been grouped together in 2D. So you see that like all of the whales and the snails. <laughs> um, dinos, we have triceratops here. Um, there is a unicorn cluster in here somewhere. I forget what it is exactly. Bugs. Um, so again, just organizing large amounts of data. And it doesn't have to be visual at all. Um, we can do this also with audio. So for example, if you analyze uh, little bits of audio. Oh, looks like I'm missing the audio. There we go. Look at similar audio samples that we've grouped together. Pretty fun. Um, but the uh, and this may not seem very interesting. Very interesting if you're if you're a journalist or an activist or you know, citizen scientist. But um, a lot of times we are also dealing with high volumes of audio data. I don't have a good example of this. This is just like silly, but. Um, suppose you're interested in um, clustering according to voices. Maybe you're um, maybe you're monitoring lots of um, lots of phone calls, and you're interested in knowing who's talking in them. So just you know, just to put that out there. Um, okay. So natural language processing is another field that's very interesting to me, and um, traditionally it looks a lot like this. So we're kind of forming these lexical trees that uh, and, and imposing a particular grammar that we know about it. Um, and this is very interesting for journalists, right? Because a lot of journalists are often dealing with large volumes of data. And there's this emerging field of data journalism, which is just swimming in data. Uh, these you know, leaks that are constantly being dumped into the public. And even the government now has a, a, like a website for, um, or at least I'm talking about the US government. I think all governments have similar um, resources for making publicly available data, which is really hard to find interesting stories in unless you begin to be comfortable um, working with tools of natural language processing. Otherwise, there's just not enough time to go through all of it. And it used to be really hard to do because it required a lot of expert programming. But now we can just put everything into a neural network, and it does it kind of all for us. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. So one of the really interesting things that's been developed over the last few years are um, language embeddings. So like word 2 vec is, is a particularly well-known um, example of this, and you're looking at some images from word 2 vec what words of act does is it takes words in a corpus of text and you train a neural network to predict what the next word in the sequence of words is going to be. And actually you can make it predict anything. It doesn't even, it can be, you can just be predicting uh, whether or not a sequence of words makes any sense or not. Um, it almost doesn't matter. But if you force a neural network to learn a representation that does this task particularly well, if it's a language related task, what it does is it um, is able to, in the same way with the images where we extracted this high-level feature vector, we can do that with words as well. So you embed 
words, you, you extract a high dimensional, usually like 100, you know, maybe anywhere between 30 and 500 um, element vector, which describes the every word. And what's really interesting about them is that there are a lot of geometric relationships uh, are preserved in, with respect to like the semantics of those words. So like the classic example of this is that there's a sort of gender vector that appears in, in, um, in a lot of these corpora. So for example, the vector between king and queen is the same as the vector between man and woman. And the vector between Spain and Madrid is similar to Italy and Rome, Germany and Berlin, Turkey and Ankara, you know, state ca uh, country capitals. And it also finds grammatical relationships as well. So big to bigger, small to larger, cold to colder, um, and um, you know all, all sorts of relationships. The president of a of a particular um, country, things of that sort. And that's really interesting. And we can do this not just with words, but we can do it with entire phrases or sentences or documents. And it makes it much easier to do things like document retrieval, which is a really really relevant task. Again, if you're interested in working with a particular collection of documents and you found a particularly interesting one and you want to find more that are like it, maybe to shake out more information, well you can do this by uh, applying some of these techniques to it. So this is a project um, just from a, a few months ago where, uh, and this actually doesn't use word to deck, so I'm cheating a little bit, I'm using a, a more traditional technique called TFIDF, which is term frequency inverse document frequency, it's a traditional sort of technique for counting co-occurrences of, wor of words in documents. And you can do it to, and then apply a TSNI onto it. You can do this to do something like this, where you can take, these are all Wikipedia articles that have been grouped together according to their content. And it's done in an entirely unsupervised way. So you can see that there's like a cluster of um, feminist articles here at the top. And there's, I think, a nationalism cluster over here. There's a Marxist cluster somewhere over here. And this is kind of a neat way of browsing Wikipedia late at night, um, if, if that's the kind of thing you do. As I do. Um, so I kinda, I'll go quickly through these. You can think of lots more. Natural language processing is a really interesting field and um, it's used for things like language translation, of course, is being taken over by neural network based models. Um, De-anonymization is another really interesting technique that might be, uh, you, can, you can really, um, using these techniques, you can identify writing styles. Uh, and it's pretty scary actually what kind of, um, you know, not anonymous, you may think something is anonymous because you don't put your name on it, but really um, your own characteristics really can shine through the way you write something. And we can do with very high precision accuracy um, identifying the writer of something or, or even just by hand or handwriting, um, which is quite interesting and it's done using these kinds of systems. Um, question answering is another one. I, I've been, this one is more speculative, but I'd love a sort of fact checker, um, automatic fact checking. Um, applications, maybe around presidential election time. Um, so recurrent neural networks, I, can't, I don't have enough time to really say, say much about them, except that they're um, neural networks that operate on sequences of data. So for example, um, sequences of words. And if you combine it with um, convolutional neural networks, you can take a convolutional neural network which extracts the visual characteristics of a particular image, and then use that to condition a recurrent neural network. I know this is like, maybe this is to, you know, for a 20 minute talk is kind of like cramming everything in. Uh, but the point is we can do things like this. So you can um, look at some of these images and you can see what's going on. Right, so we're labeling these like, okay, so a white laptop on the table, man sitting on the table. These are all labeled by neural networks and that's really, really interesting that we can do that. And just a couple years ago, none of this was, was remotely possible. Um, one, I had some fun with this, applying it to the video from Boston Dynamics. So you guys have seen this video. This is um, a, a company which makes these humanoid robots that are incredible. Um, they can walk through like really tough terrain. So I decided to use this dense captioning software on top of it. And um, you can see that it has a lot of fun trying to figure out what's inside of it. So there's two people on skis, a tree with no leaves. and. <laughs> And actually, if you watch this long enough, let me fast forward a bit through it, there's a point where the guy, you know, the guy really starts to, to mess with it a little bit. I don't know about you, but I, I start to feel a little bit of empathy for the robot, just, you know, in this... <laughs> exactly. You hear this, the gasping from the audience as it's being abused. But actually, so one interesting thing is, 
the robot is never, it's never labeled as a robot or a machine uh, because it doesn't have that in its vocabulary. So it's always a blue motorcycle or a person on skis or something like that. So this reflects something really interesting that these things um, are really spitting out what we, what we train them, what we condition them to do for us. Um, just for more fun, I applied it to deep dream videos. I didn't show deep dream, but uh, for those of you who saw it when you know, deep, deep dream came out last year, um, you see, started seeing a lot of these psychedelic dogs everywhere. So it turns out that when a neural network is responsible for labeling it, it actually figures this out quite well. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of like gloss over style transfer. This is on my my website, and this is some, something I've had a lot of fun with. But style transfer is a technique where you can recompose images in the style of other images, and it works using convolutional neural networks. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain this, but, but basically, we're trying to produce an image which has the same form as the output image. But the texture, and you can kind of see this reflected in those activations, like what we saw in the demo, it's very similar to the activations of the um, style image. So this is like the Mona Lisa recomposed in, um, in Starry Night style. And this is just a few more samples. And you see it works very consistently on such an abstract topic as style. This is really mind-blowing still. And this has only been around for a year. Um, and that's, that's kind of, and you can do it on video as well. And there's kind of repositories that do um, that I've been kind of borrowing from, from GitHub, a lot of great open source software, and um, which is able to do this on, on video as well. So um, I'll kind of show you one quick demo and then show you ML for a. Oh, this is one other thing. Yeah, I just made this yesterday. Um, there's a really nice repository, unfortunately, not enough time to talk about it, but we're doing really, really uncanny um, uh, like class visualization. So this is basically a, a um, a repository which is able to generate autonomously a neural network which is able to generate these classes. So you see knee pads and patios, a tra trailer truck, minivan. Lots of them work better than others, uh, but you see that they're 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 photorealistic in some some cases. There's our laptop. Um, go down here. There's a big cluster of dogs, and again, this is all using convolutional neural networks and, and generative models, which I haven't really. Spoken about generative adversarial networks, another really interesting area, but uh, I'll have to leave that for another. Um, I'll quickly close with um, Cubist Mirror, which is another, um, which is something that, um, just for fun, doing style transfer in real time. So this is kind of like, yeah, there we go. Um, so, the, oh, yeah, it has a little trouble starting up. So that's me, as you can see. I'm afraid to turn my computer around the it's a little slow, it works faster on a, on a little bit uh, computer with better resources, but just for fun, let me, let me apply this to a different style. So now I'll make it Kandinsky. Yeah. There's a little overlap because I'm, I have it threaded, there's like four of them at the same time. There we go. So this is Kandinsky Mary now. That's very slow. Um, so what's really interesting is when this stuff, over just one year, it went from being done in a couple of minutes to a couple of seconds, and even almost real time now. And you know, coming from a media arts background, you know that when something becomes um, faster, it doesn't just become faster, it becomes different. You can now use it in phones, mobile applications, um, there's now apps that do this kind of stuff, and people are, are work, slowly working it into you know, Adobe type software, Photoshop, and, and doing this, this sort of stuff. So. Um, that's, that's all of this is happening quite fast. The technique was only demonstrated a year ago. Okay, since I'm out of time, I'm going to close the presentation and quickly tell you if you're interested in more of this stuff. Um, as was uh, mentioned, I have a, um, an in-progress book about machine learning for artists that I'm, I'm co-writing with Francis Tseng, who's, who's going to be here later in the fall. We'll be running some workshops. And um, it's basically a book about machine learning for artists, and it's you can see some of the chapters here, they're all being drafted. The neural networks chapter is the closest to being done. Um, you can see it it's here. Um, and it kind of like introduces the field to a pretty broad audience, but gets into the math and then um, and is kind of buffered by a, a bunch of like interactive demos. These are just images right now, but there'll be demos later. And um, it comes with a bunch of guides, so like code examples. Um, which help you sort of get into this stuff. This is all, all being worked on. These are more practical demos that we're making. Um, there's a bunch of the dem um, sorry practical guides. The demos are there. Um, and also, I've been putting all my classes online. So I've run two so far. There's one 
that I ran at ITP at NYU uh, just this past spring. So this is machine learning for artists. There's about 12 hours of lectures that explain everything that I've been talking about, except much with much more detail. Um, so hopefully, if you're interested in that, all the lectures are annotated and they're available here. Um, and the one that I just finished is called the Neural Aesthetic. We, we have this at School of Mod. This was just closed last week. Um, so for those of you who want to know this stuff a little deeper, I encourage you to go here and, 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 um, and keep in touch. We're also on Twitter. <laughs> so this will be kind of tweeting like relevant, um, relevant links from new software, let's say, or um, current events that uh, affect AI, uh, machine learning research. I'm not quite getting to it very quickly, but you can see it's ML4A underscore. Um, and my own work, um, you can catch me um, on my web. You can see a lot of this on my website um, and so on. So um, I'll wrap up there. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know. Yeah, Adam? Do you know what is the state of the art? Just, sorry. Oh, sure. Just take the microphone so the people in the video can get questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you know what is the state-of-the-art classification for stylometry that you mentioned? I don't. I don't know offhand. Um, stylometry is a handwriting classification, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Rec recognizing. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. Um, I don't know what the numbers are. But I don't know if there's like any well-known benchmark because. Usually, if they're reported, there's there's some sort of like a like a canonical, like for example, classifying MNIST or CPAR or something like that. Um, I don't I don't know what it is. I know that there's a lot of it's much better than people realize <laughs> than most of the public is aware of. Yeah. Um, let's assume I have an audio file um, which contains shouts, like uh, a fearful shout, a joy joyful shout, and someone who is dying or something like that, and I want to classify them. Is it better to have um, three binary neural networks who, who know, yes it is a fearful child or not, or is it better to have one neural network which can um, classify between these three shards? Uh, if you have a neural network with, let's say, like three outputs, it's effectively the same thing as having you know, three neural, what you mentioned, the first, first option. Um, Really, the thing that matters the most is like the relevant feature extraction than the architecture of the, of the network. Um, so audio, audio is actually a pretty, is pretty hard. It's much harder than images so far. We haven't done very because there's this whole temporal element to it. Time, time screws up everything in uh, machine learning. We're getting better, but um, there's still a lot of a lot of progress to be made. Yeah, check out ISMIR. I S M I R. It's a conference about um, like. Um, Music information retrieval. There's also audio based on or, or like speech, um, speech to text conferences and things like that. Yeah. Okay. If there's no more questions from the audience, I would have like one last question. Uh, can you tell us something more about how this is or could be used in a political context, or is there you have any thoughts on like, ideas where it's used, or is there any? Like example where it is used already in a political context. Um, when you say political, do you mean like with, with, with activists? Well, there's a uh, there's this kind of emerging field of like data journalism. So there's there's a, a lot of interest coming from journalists in, in uh, being able to program their own routines for sifting through data uh, because you know they're like I said we're swimming in data and and it's really hard to find the interesting stories. Um, that are not already reported by someone else. So there's um, there's a lot of interesting stories that are hidden in you know document dumps coming from who knows where. I don't, I don't know. Like uh, if you're interested in what the um, how the power companies in your local area, let's say, I don't know, just to toss that random example, uh, how they're distributing energy. Um, that's really difficult to find out. You know, they're gonna they have their own press releases, things like that. But, but a lot of that stuff is available in publicly released data sets, and um, there's a lot of stories in there. Uh, it's not always, not always clear that it's being done in the most appropriate way, and I think a lot of journalists are, being, are interested in being able to access these kind of data sets and, and, and pull out this kind of interesting statistical information from them. So, yeah, that's the most general case. I don't know if that's a very good example, because um, I'm myself not a journalist, but um, but you can maybe get a sense, a sense of the use case. Yeah. 
Okay, well done, Gene Cogan. Thanks a lot. <laughs>